Welcome to Orange Weekly, presented by Krause Health. Alongside Nate Mink, I'm Brent Dax. Coming up, Syracuse football head coach Dino Babers describes a painful decision he had to make during Syracuse's bye week. And it's time to start talking hoops on Orange Weekly, and Syracuse.com's Mike Waters will join us. But Nate, we start with football out of the bye week against Duke. You mentioned that painful decision that Dino Babers had to make, and that was firing defensive coordinator Brian Ward. So here Syracuse goes into its 10th game. They still are mathematically eligible for a bowl game, but it seems like a season lost. How much will this change make a difference for the defense, do you think? We'll see, Brent. I mean, it's really difficult to expect a complete overhaul of the defense. I do think they'll tinker with some of the sub packages. Maybe, maybe you take a look at, at some different personnel, you know, particularly at the linebacker position. That's where Stenard's going to transition his coaching duties now with, with Ward moving out. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's three games. It's just hard to change things uh, at a macro level in, in the middle of November. Duke comes up for the Orange here. There's a team that's lost three in a row itself, still looking to get bowl eligible as well. They've got to win two of their last three to get there. They've got a dual-threat quarterback in Quentin Harris and a smart coach, as Dino Babers described, Nate, and David Cutcliffe. What do you see in this matchup with Syracuse and the Blue Devils? I, I think it's a, a real good opportunity for Syracuse to, to win a football game again. Duke is okay. You know, they're not particularly dominant in one facet of the game. They're sort of middle of the pack in – whether it's rush defense, uh, throwing the ball, uh, running the ball. They, they just lost their starting center uh, for the season, so that's going to impact their ability. Uh, I think Syracuse, you know, transitioning on the other side of the ball, I think they are going to be a little bit in, uh, inspired to, to put forth a better effort defensively. Uh, I do think they might get a little additional help in the middle of that defensive line in McKinley Williams this week. I think that can aid their rush defense and really – you know, toughen up that middle of the defense, which obviously was a was a huge issue a couple weeks ago against BC. You mentioned the starting center being out. This is a Duke team that's got 21 turnovers. That leads to Power 5 right now. So all that said, Nate, it's prediction time on that matchup. And I do think Syracuse is going to lose this game to Duke. I'm going to go with a score of 33-24. to 24. What say you? I, I Like I said earlier, I think Syracuse wins the game. I have Syracuse winning 30-27 to 27 at the end of the day. I do think they're going to play a lot better defensively. I think Duke is, is struggling to move the ball offensively, and I think Syracuse has shown some steps forward the last couple of, say, the last two out of the last four halves. You know, the second half against Florida State and that first half against Boston College, I thought they did some things offensively. I think they'll be able to sustain drives and, and just get enough points to beat Duke on Saturday. One more football thought from you, Nate. Offensively, a team that's holding on to dear life for its bowl eligibility here, what steps have to be made there? Lost in the shuffle of that Boston College game was the offense did look a little more diverse and was rolling, and Tommy DeVito right now is not throwing an interception in 131 straight attempts. I think first and foremost, they have to play good defense. You know, they, they ha that's still the side of the ball that has their best personnel the older players have to play well so you know they got to get better play out of Evan Foster Chris Frederick you know if they get McKinley Williams back for these last three games I think that will really aid their rush defense but the other side of that coin is they're gonna have to score particularly these last two games against Louisville and Wake Forest those are more explosive offenses they can I can see a kind of a shootout game at Louisville in a couple weeks and then Wake Forest yeah they lost their all-conference type receiver uh, for the year but they have a really really dangerous quarterback in Jamie Newman and Wake's going to be playing potentially for an Orange Bowl bid so they'll have a lot to play for if Syracuse wants to beat Louisville and Wake they might need to elevate their score into the 40s to do that. We heard about the change now let's hear from the head coach about it here's Syracuse head coach Dino Babers in Syracuse Soundbites.
Well, if we got this guy on set, it must mean it's basketball season. Mike Waters, welcome back to Orange Weekly. It's good to be here. Hoops is here. Hoops is here. We had some hoops at the Dome Wednesday night. Syracuse got on the winning side of things, taking care of Colgate 70-54. to And there were a few players in that game that really stood up that people are looking to be productive this year, namely Barama Sidibe. Barama had a great game, and that you're right. They do need him, him to play well this year. Uh, they got him the ball early, and they got him the ball in the right place, they had to get in the lane near the basket where he can get the ball up. And, you know, he, he's shown the ability to shoot over people, and he did a great job in there. Uh, the best thing about Barama, though, in addition to the points, he rebounded the ball. He was active at both ends of the floor. He was really a rebounding force, finished with 14, and uh, with, added that to his 12 points, his third double-double of his career. It was interesting to see the dynamic between Joe Girard and Jalen Carey, Jim Beheim, wasting no time, comes to his press conference 10 minutes after the game and says that Joe is going to start at point guard going forward here. What dynamic does he bring to the table versus what Jalen Carey was unfortunately not doing in his case? Well, the one thing that's been surprising in watching Joe is, you know, when he comes from Glens Falls High School, we think of him as nothing but a scorer with the 4,700 uh, career points there. But he handles the ball well. He, when he's, he's playing point guard and he's acting like a point guard, he's distributing the ball, he's handling it, he's not turning it over. The other thing that he adds that Jalen isn't right now or can't is that the other teams have to respect Joe's ability to shoot from the outside. Joe really hasn't gotten hot yet. Uh, he's not shooting the ball real well, but he's such a threat. Everybody knows he can shoot, and I think that's opening up the floor and creating spaces, and it's, I think it's one of the reasons why they were able to get the ball to Barama so much last night. It's interesting to see the, the, the dynamic and the transition, Mike, because Joe, I think he told you in the locker room after the game, when he was at Glens Falls, he wasn't really a point guard, wasn't really a shooting guard, he was just kind of the guard, the guy that could score 50 yeah. points a game, but could distribute, could facilitate the offense, and I think he realizes that he can almost do a, not a, a downsized version of that, but he doesn't have to do everything at Syracuse. You take what's there, but there's just a different energy. You could see it in that game and even in the Virginia game at times when he's running the point. He's comfortable having the ball in his hands. You no, know, he's not going to score 50 points a game. He's not going to be asked to score 20 a game right now, but he's comfortable with the ball in his hands. He also talked about his experience as a high school quarterback. And remember, he, he led Glens Falls High School to state titles twice, as a sophomore and again as a senior. And he talked about being used to seeing the entire field. And he says that helps when he converts over to basketball and being able to see the entire floor and see where players are and where they're moving to. So. Was he a true point guard in high school? No, but he had the ball in his hands all the time, and as a quarterback, he was a point guard on the football field. So here you have a freshman being handed the reins of point guard, and Mike, this is an interesting uh, aspect with this team because you got four new players, four young players in the lineup for this team, and Jim even said it at his press conference the other night that it might take 12 games just to figure out who the heck they are at this point. And I agree, and I think that might be one reason you're seeing the switch at point guard so early in the season. They've got three more games before they hit a stretch that's going to be crucial to them for their whole, for their NCAA tournament resume. After these next three games, they're going to go down to New York and play twice. They're going to play Iowa. They're going to play at Georgia Tech and at Georgetown. I feel if, if they don't feel like things are working really well right now, they got to make a switch now and get Joe Girard in there so he gets three games as the starter against Seattle, Cornell, and Bucknell to get ready for that next five-game stretch. That's Orange Weekly presented by Krause Health. For Nate Mink, for Mike Waters, I'm Brent Axe. We'll talk to you next time.